Hello and welcome to Sky Notes from Rugby and District Astronomical Society for the period from the 19th of May to the 16th of June 2013. We'll start off by looking at the night sky and this is for around about midnight on the 19th of May and around about 2300 on the 2nd of June. The planets will have moved on the 2nd of June, uh, Moon and Saturn will have shifted position, Saturn only slightly but the Moon by quite a lot, but the stars will be in roughly the same position they are as shown here. One thing to note is that near Vega we also have Deneb and Altair forming the Summer Triangle, meaning that the Summer Constellations will be beginning to rise in the east and getting higher as the year goes on. On the 26th of May at uh, around 21.45, Mercury, Jupiter and Venus will form a nearly equilateral triangle in the west-northwest sky after sunset, although sunset uh, is quite late and the sky will still be very light. You may just be able to make out the bright star Capella but you should be able to see the planets low down on the horizon if you have a low horizon. If you want to look for these with binoculars you'd be best waiting until the sun has actually set and it should make for a very nice uh, subject to uh, look at with binoculars. A bit later on the 5th of June, Mercury is 7 degrees above the horizon just after sunset at 21:25 uh, hours, and Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, it actually appears to be further away from the Sun, has greater separation than Venus or Jupiter. Venus, of course, lies between the Earth and Mercury, and Jupiter lies beyond the orbit of Mars. So, how can a planet beyond the orbit of Mars appears to be closer to the Sun than the one that actually orbits closest to the Sun? It's quite easy if we draw the orbit of some planets here. I've omitted Mars in this one, and here is the Earth. So we have Mercury orbiting closest to the Sun, shown here, and we'll draw a line from an observer on the Earth to the centre of Mercury. The next planet out from the Sun after Mercury is Venus, and it appears to be orbiting slightly behind Mercury at the moment so I'll draw another line towards the centre of Venus shown here and finally Jupiter and although it orbits outside of the Earth by quite a long way when it's the far side of the Sun the angular separation can appear quite small so if we draw another line in here you would see that Mercury would appear higher in the sky than either Venus or Jupiter would We'll have a look at some conjunctions now of the inferior planets. Those are the ones that are between the Earth and the Sun, and in our solar system's case, they are Mercury and Venus. So we start off with the Earth and the inferior planet shown here. This is called an inferior conjunction because the planet is in between the Earth and the Sun. That's the way that I always remember it. We have another conjunction called a superior conjunction which is when the Sun is in the way of the planet. Now the thing is with this that when we would normally see planets at their best is when they're closest to us. That certainly applies to all the superior planets which are outside of the Earth's orbit. The trouble is when the planet is at its closest to us it's also on the same side as the Sun to us so at best we'd see a crescent or uh, uh, just a completely black circle um, which we wouldn't be able to observe like the Moon. Obviously when there's a total eclipse of the Sun, the Moon is new because it's between us and the Sun. And when there's a total eclipse of the Moon, if you were sat stood on the Moon, you would actually see the dark side of the Earth because the Sun would be the far side of the Earth. There's one more feature to have a look at on the in inferior planets, which is elongation. If a planet has a 90 degree angle between the Sun and the Earth, this is described as being at maximum elongation and it's the greatest angular separation from the Sun when seen from the Earth. We'll have a look at Saturn now and some of the facts that everybody knows about Saturn. Um, 9 to 10 AU from the Sun, it's actually just over 9 to just over 10 AU its orbit. Its orbital period is uh, 29 and a half years. There are 62 moons in a stable orbit of which around about 57 or 58 are named and its day lasts just over 10 hours. The fact that it will float on water is a bit misleading. The average density of the planet is less than that of water, but if you did it for a big enough bucket of water to drop it into, the rocky core would sink and the gas would probably just evaporate away. So the actual planet itself wouldn't float, but the average density is far less than that of water. 
here we have Saturn and Titan imaged uh, in 2010 with a 4SE which is a 4 inch Max Zutov Cassegrain telescope a 2 times Barlow lens and a next image CCD system and you can see that the rings are pretty much edge on to us here two years later on the 22nd of May 2012 using the same camera Barlow and imaging system and again processed in Registax 2.1 we have this image of Saturn where you can clearly see the rings have opened up we're not quite so edge on to them finally on the 7th of April 2013 there's this image of Saturn taken with a 9 and a quarter inch telescope without the Barlow lens but also using the next image the image size is about the same as that taken with a 4 inch with a Barlow lens but the greater aperture of the telescope means that there's greater detail to be seen within the rings and on the cloud banding itself. No filters were used in taking this image and it hasn't been post-processed apart from running through Registax and some of the wavelets adjusted slightly. But some of the cloud bands can be clearly seen as can the Cine division within the ring. And the rings are open at this point around about 19 degrees to the Earth and we're looking roughly at the planet's north pole. You can even see the shadow of the planet on the rings in this image. If you have a DSLR and overexpose the planet itself, you'll be able to pick up some of the moons. And at 23.30 GMT on the 3rd of May this year, we had Titan, Enceladus, Dion, Tethys and Rhea um, nicely spread out around the planet. Dion is below the planet, uh, as it appears to be anyway. That's because of the rings being tilted towards us, meaning that the average orbit of the moons is also tilted towards us. Looking at the North Pole in this image from the Cassini probe, you can see this very strange hexagonal storm. It, it's a stable structure, much like the red spot in Jupiter, and it has been recreated in the laboratory by two contra-rotating fluids. And to give you an idea of the scale, each of the flat sides of this storm is longer than the Earth is wide. Of course, one of the highlights of the early part of this year has been the comet Pan-STARRS. It's past its best now and getting increasingly more difficult to pick up as not only does the comet dim but it's also getting lighter in the sky as we see it from the UK. So here we are on the 27th of April you can just about make out pan stars above Cassiopeia in this DSLR photograph a uh, 30 second exposure at a fairly high ISO rate and you can just about pick up the comet above Cassiopeia. The next image was taken a couple of days later and is actually of the comet itself as seen through a 9 quarter inch telescope. And here we have the comet with some background stars taken a little bit later in the evening again with a 9 and a quarter inch scope and a digital camera. This is on the 6th of May and on the 8th of May you can see the planet passing the three Hipparchus stars that are almost in a straight line heading towards Cetus. Some iridium flares have been caught recently. The uh, first one here is a magnitude minus 7.3 passing through Leo. Not all of the sickle or body of the line is in the shot, but you can see Regulus here just above the house, and then the body of the line shown here. On the same evening, over in Aquila, we had a 5.7 flare from satellite number 13, and here is Altair to give you an idea of the position of the flare. Going back to the night sky, we're going to be zooming in now on an area of interest down here towards the south. We have Arcturus and Saturn, which will both be easy to find, um, Saturn being in Virgo at the moment. And we'll zoom in and we'll look at this area just over here, which is the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. And in particular, we're going to be looking at five of the Messier objects, which are all globular clusters. Globular clusters lie in a halo around the galaxy and they're actually north and south of the galactic plane rather than just um, lying in the same plane as the arms. So we have four, five of them here, M9, 10, 12, 14 and 107. And here's what they look like. This is M9. Um, these images are all taken with a 9 and a quarter inch scope because that's the one that I was using that particular evening and they will be visible in smaller instruments as well although not quite as well defined even in a nine and a quarter visually they are the fairly small fuzzy blobs typical of Messier objects M10 is a little bit bigger and brighter than M9 
M9 is also quite low down on the horizon, so you're looking through quite a lot of what's known as air mass, which is the extra thickness of the atmosphere compared to looking straight up at an object at the zenith when you're looking through the thinnest possible part of the atmosphere. M12 is brighter again than M10 and again it's very slightly higher up in altitude so you're looking through a little bit less of the air mass and it's uh, quite a nice globular cluster and uh, very easy to see the dense heart of the cluster. M14 um, there's a few variations in the colours of the stars here as you can see in this image and finally 107 it's a more densely packed object visually but um, it's about the same sort of magnitudes as the other ones and will appear as more of a fuzzy blob than uh, than will 10, 12 and 14. Move on to another part of the sky now, slightly to the east of Ophiuchus and rising we have Hercules, Lyra and Cygnus and these are the ones we're going to be looking at now. Starting off with a bright star Vega you'll easily be able to pick out the keystone in the constellation of Hercules. It's well named because it shares the shape of the keystone at the top of a, an archway in a building as you can see in this picture here. So go back to the keystone and looking along on the top two stars moving down about a third of the way you'll find the great globular cluster of M13. Here we have M13 image through a 4 inch telescope, slightly out of focus, but this is what you could expect to see visually through an 8 inch or greater aperture. Using a 9 and a quarter inch scope to image the cluster, the individual stars do become clearer, although, although you would not pick this up with the naked eye in anything smaller than an, than an observatory class telescope, but you, it's always worth having a look at even through fairly small telescopes or binoculars and it's pretty much a borderline naked eye object as well. In 1974 from the Arecibo telescope which is a thousand foot radio telescope it was set to transmit instead of receive and we sent this message out towards M13. Slight problem being that in the intervening 50,000 years it takes for the signal to reach M13 the position of M13 would have changed relative to the Earth and the uh, radio signal will have completely missed it. The binary signal was arranged in such a way that the height and the width are two prime numbers and if the signal is rearranged the other way instead of getting the image you see here you, just look, you would just get a random collection of pulses so hopefully anybody that did intercept it would be able to work out which way around to arrange the signal and it would appear here. So starting at the top we have the binary numbers from 1 to 10 represented then some atomic weights of the lighter elements Next down we have the chemical elements that are needed for building DNA which is essential to life as we know it although there may be other forms of life possible out there. Then we have a representation of the double helix of DNA with the number of base pairs they thought there were in 1974. We know this number to be inaccurate now but um, it is a good indication of we know what we're talking about on the sciences for anybody that did intercept this and managed to decode it. To the left of the human figure we have a binary representation of the world's population at the time in 1974 of 3 billion. Then next down we have the solar system running from the sun at the right to poor old Pluto at the left. And with Pluto being shown in the solar system plus the error in the base pairs we'd probably have to send out a correction. You notice the earth is highlighted by being raised up slightly compared to the other planets illustrated and also directly under the human figure. Then we have the Arecibo radio telescope. The M shape isn't actually a representation of the antenna. It is a, it's an illustration showing that it is a parabolic reflector. Finally at the bottom they've encoded the diameter of the radio telescope in binary as well. Now you might be wondering, quite rightly, how would you work out the height of a human or the diameter of a telescope from some binary figures without a reference? Well, since any intelligent life may not work in feet and inches or metres, these are encoded in such a way that the figures for the, the height and the diameter of the telescope are multiples of the 21 centimetre wavelength that was used to send it. So it doesn't matter if you call it 21 centimetres, 21 uber goobles or 2.1 thingamajigs. If you do the multiplication you will actually get the height and the size of the telescope.
So all in all, it was a pretty good bit of thinking when they designed this particular signal to send out into space. And of course SETI are listening for the same sorts of signals coming our way that might be sent our way by intelligent life. We'll move over now to Cygnus and Lyra and we'll start here with Chai Cygni which is a variable star, it's S class, maximum magnitude around about 3.3 .3, but with a minimum magnitude of 14.2 it does dip in and out of visual range over its period of 408 and a bit days. So this is something worth having a look for as Cygnus crosses the sky during the summer and see if you can pick up the gradual brightening and dimming of Chai Cygni. A lot easier to pick out are two other objects, Alberio and Messier 57. Alberio is a lovely blue-yellow contrasting double star, very easy to find and very easy to pick out in small telescopes. Binoculars may pick it out if you have a larger set and can mount them on a tripod, so that uh, you don't shake around and not actually settle on the star itself. Seen through a nine and a quarter inch scope, um, Alberio is Beta Cygni, the second brightest star in Cygnus, and uh, it's clearly shown here the slightly brighter yellow star, the slightly dimmer bluey coloured star. Of course we also have M57 in Lyra near the star Vega. Um, this is through a 4 inch telescope. You wouldn't actually pick out the colours in a 4 inch. This is a sort of 8 inch or above scope again to actually pick out the colours. But you would see a grey ring looking a bit like a doughnut. Um, quite easy to detect under dark skies with smaller instruments. This is imaged through the nine and a quarter again and you see that it's not quite a ring it's a little bit more elliptical than that and of course as usual once I've got an image like this Chris Longthorne sends me one of his uh, wonderful images uh, taken with a full-on large diameter scope and CCD system so I had to go one better and trump him with this one taken from the Hubble Space Telescope courtesy of NASA and you can see a lot of the structure here um, including some irregularities around the uh, outside edge of the ring and the streaking of the gas being blown off by the central star which is still just about visible in the middle. We'll start off with some from Beth Dukes. She's fairly new into observational astronomy and she's had the loan of the club telescope and she's been using an afocal camera phone method and here's the camera she was using. Um, this is not actually her camera, but it's a waterproof Sony. And she's got this picture of the moon. This is taken with a four and a half inch Skywatcher Newtonian reflector. Um, the blue fringing around the moon is caused by the eyepieces. They're not the greatest quality in the world. And uh, using a red filter would have got rid of some of this blue fringing, but um, there aren't any filters we've got available to lend out with the telescope at the moment. It does catch the main features of the moon though. Um, you've got sinus iridium well illuminated at this point to the uh, top of the image. Uh, the craters Copernicus and Tycho are clearly visible and of course the Sea of Tranquility is the site of the first manned landing on another body. Changing eyepieces for a 10mm into a 25mm. Beth got a uh, better image in terms of magnification at the top showing sinus iridium again and you can clearly see how the walls of the outside part of the crater that uh, form part of this uh, are illuminated as the sun rises and catches the tops of the peaks before it illuminates the floor itself but it does show what you can get with a telescope that's probably cheaper than the phone she used to take the photo here are some of my images taken with a variety of cameras and telescopes uh, this was taken just with a camera on a tripod, unfortunately it's out of focus, but it's, it's an iridium flare from one of the Rugby and District Astronomical Society's uh, public events, and uh, we all got to see this iridium flare through the tree. Through the 6 inch we've got some of the craters on the moon, again roughly where the terminator is to bring out some more of the detail. Uh, M5, this was quite a nice find actually, I'd not seen it before until this year and uh, had a look for it and it was a bit of a wow moment. It's not quite as large as M13 but it's very impressive and you can see from the image here you can pick out quite a lot of the detail using a DSLR. Some of the double coloured stars I like looking at um, I actually saw 24COM before I saw Alberio and it's 
to be honest, it's one of my favourite ones more than Alberio because it's the first one that I saw. Now, this was taken through a uh, 4SE using a DSLR in 2012, and you can clearly see the difference in the colours, even with a fairly small aperture telescope. Visually, you'll see these colours and the separation dead easily. Here we have it through the 9 inch, um, slightly easier to see the separation and the colours. Here we have SIG 3053, uh, it's another orange blue combination. One of the things I'm doing this year is hunting double stars and binary stars, and this was another one on the list. And 35COM, this is uh, not so much of a colour contrast, more a magnitude contrast. You will pick this up in a 4 inch scope as well, so you don't need to use the 9 inch that I did for this. Again, if I've got the scope set up and I'm doing a, a run of images or a run of observing, I'll tend to use the same scope during the evening rather than keep swapping over. Unless I've got time to set up two scopes, then I can uh, use both of them. And here we have M103 in Cassiopeia. Uh, Cassiopeia was quite low down when I took this photo, so there is a little bit of orangey sky glow, even though I live in a fairly dark place. It's a nice little open cluster, this one, very triangular in shape, and there's some contrast in the colours for the stars, which again, you can pick up visually. You don't need a long exposure photograph to take this. And uh, I've quite happily observed this in the 4 inch, as well as the, the big beast of the 9 and the quarter. Finally, looking through the 4 inch with the appropriate um, solar filters in place. Um, early in May we didn't have a lot in the way of sunspots, we did have some fairly well centred on the sun. Zooming in with the webcam instead of the DSLR that I took the last photo with, the DSLR will capture the whole of the disc of the sun whereas the webcam, um, because of its shorter focal length, will give greater magnification. And here we have the same sunspot group just on two different frames and you'll see that part of it does look a bit like the Owl Nebula. Uh, the Owl Nebula lies in Ursa Major near the galaxy M108 which is fairly edge on to us. This is a single shot so the image quality isn't quite as good. I didn't actually know I'd got M108 in the same frame. I was just uh, using a, a quick photo and move scope technique to get the Owl Nebula more centred and with a focal reducer on a nine and a quarter inch scope you can actually get both objects in the same frame and I'll have to return to this one in the future to get a better image. So here's the Owl Nebula, it's uh, ten processed images that are stacked and you can clearly see the two circles of the eyes of the Owl and if we put it next to the sunspot you can see the similarity that made me think Owl Nebula as soon as I saw it. So it's thanks to Chris Longthorne and Beth Dukes for the images that I've been using today and we'll leave you with this lovely image taken from the Hubble Space Telescope of Messier Object M57, the Ring Nebula in Lyra near Vega.